I was told the first thing I should do is check to see if you can hear me in the back. I'm, I'm a professor from New York. I'm not used to not being heard. Um, loud and obnoxious, not a problem for me. Um, I also am, am absolutely thrilled to be here, and I really want to thank the conference organizers for putting me between you and the rush hour. And after one of the 100 most powerful women in Canada. It is important as a speaker. Uh, and I know that it's a long day, so your brains are going Dah. And I promise I will have no facts, I will have no concepts, I'll have nothing interesting. <laughs> Just cruise out for the next 45 minutes and go with it. Um, it's important as a speaker that I connect both to the audience and I connect to current events. I will not attempt a um, Canadian accent. Um, we can say dollar all we want. Look the dollar, got it, all right? But I'm not doing that. Uh, instead, I'm going to tell a joke. A librarian, a politician, and a nun are trapped at the bottom of a collapsed mine. Audience, current events. Yeah. After the initial shock of the cave-in, they all decide in the complete blackness to venture out and explore the rest of the shaft for potential salvation and an exit. They tie themselves together and go groping through the shaft. A little ways down, they bump into something clearly metallic and smooth and not boulder-like. And so they all gather around and begin to feel to determine what it is. The politician says, clearly a piece of malfunctioning mining equipment. And when I get back to the top, I'm going to have hearings and find out who's responsible for it. The nun says, no, 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 this is clearly a gift from God. This is a magical door that if we open it, we will be free. Librarian, what do you think it is? The librarian said, well, let me see. We have a group of people with no leader groping through the dark, feeling for something and hope and either looking for someone to blame or a miracle. It feels a lot like a library committee to me. <laughs> so I think, no facts, no stats. There you go. So I think this is part of the question that we're here to deal with. And I would just like to say that I hate this question. This question sucks. Pardon me. It sucks for many reasons. And I'm going to get into it in detail. I will also say that it's a good thing um, I should admit now, maybe something I should have admitted to the conference organizers beforehand, I am not a futurist. I don't give a damn about the future. I, I really don't. I'm much more worried in what we should be doing today. And I really, rather than trying to predict the future, I'm much more interested in inventing the future. So my favorite quote comes from a fellow by the name of Alan Kay, who says that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I believe that. I believe that one message that we need to get across is that we don't need a committee feeling through the dark. We don't need an innovation pro temp. We don't need to have a 12 year long process to look at the possibilities to come up with a task force to divide an option that will then go through a series of conversations. We just need to get down to making our life better. All right, so that's what a little bit of what we're going to talk about. So let me get back to why I hate this question. So this is actually a question that I was, I was asked to answer at one point. The MacArthur Foundation came and said, Dave, go answer this. And I said, OK, give me money, OK. Um, I called it my not, not that MacArthur Foundation grant, Foundation MacArthur grant. Um, and I, but, but it's hilarious because I noticed that the other thing that I'm scared to death of you folks is that I've been following the LibFoo um, Twitter tag. You guys are harsh. Um, <laughs> I just, I mean, when someone got up and talked about the Age of Enlightenment and someone said, I'm putting out a preemptive strike on the Middle Ages as being important, I'm like, oh my god, he didn't even... <laughs> so anyway, they asked me to go, they, and so I do it, I call up a library director and say, yeah, what's the future of library? I call up a library director. And the first reason you realize this is a horrible question is because everyone wants to redefine it. Well, what do you mean? future of this library, future of all libraries, blah, blah, blah. and finally you just say, yeah, 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 answer the question. So I call up an academic library and director, and I'd say, what is the future of libraries? And their answer would be, well, I can't tell you the future of public libraries because they're screwed. <laughs> but in the academic libraries, it's a social space that is all about learning and knowledge. And I call up a public library director, and well, I can't tell you about academic libraries because they're screwed. But we're going to be about 
a social space that's all about learning and knowledge. And you're just like, can you please just take a moment? Right? So I'm not going to talk about the future of public, and the future of academic, and the future of school, the future of special, and the future of law. I mean, if there's any profession that's better at subdividing ourselves into little itty bitty pieces, it's probably serial killers trying to hide a body. I mean, <laughs> in academia, we are used to this model. Right? The model is take pond, divide until biggest fish in it you are. Right? <laughs> So the, for, the, so the reason I don't like this is, first of all, it assumes that there is a future. The other reason that if you look at how this question is phrased, this question is phrased very much as that it is determinate, that there is a future. And all we have to do is uncover it, which I guess if you wait long enough, that will happen. But when I ask this question and I look at it, what if you find that answer by looking at statistics, at looking at data, at looking at all this information, and you find that the future of libraries is none? If you find that the future of libraries is bordering, boarding them up and shuttering them. If you find that the future of libraries is killing the funding and deprofessionalizing folks and manning them as if they were Walmarts, right? Is that something that you would be happy with? Is that something that you would sit around and go, well, that's the future. I guess I'll go start working at Walmart. A much more interesting way of saying this is what should be the future of libraries, right? It's, it's something that we can act upon. And as we're going to talk about a lot today, this notion that we are in some ways at, at the, someone else is going to come in and shape us. Eee. I mean, no. We want to look at how we can shape that future. Now, the re next part I hate about this question, and you're going to, there, I can see the tweet already. Dave's splitting hairs. What the, I hate the notion that all we talk about is libraries. <laughs> you're sitting going, you, you do realize it's a library conference right now? How many libraries are here today? Let's look around. I don't see any ivy. There's no coffee shop in the corner or rapid reader response. And there are no students falling asleep on the third floor. We're librarians, right? The building is nothing. The building is there for us, right? So when I, I don't, this is the advantage of being the last speaker is I can pick on every other previous speaker. So when I see things like, you, when I see things like, um, iTunes up there and I see things like Facebook. Those are libraries. No, they're not. They're piles of crap. <laughs> I mean, they, yours are beautiful, but my musical taste, not good, right? Stuff does not a library make. What do you call a room full of books? It's a closet. <laughs> what do you call an empty room with a librarian? A library. If you give them an ethernet connection, sure, in 10 days, they'll have ordered lots of books. But the point is, it's the process that makes a library. It's how we function. It's what's in our head that makes us librarians. The, they named the building after us. Right? I know that's a little historical. <laughs> but if he's, if he's allowed to pick on the number zero, I'm allowed to recreate the whole naming of this. Because let's face it, we're named after Lieber, right? Which is. Latin. I failed Latin, right? First it killed the Romans, then me, right? And it means tree bark, because that's what they would write on. So technically, you're all forest rangers if you're librarians. But all right. So what should the future? So it really should be what should be the future of libraries and librarians? Because I can very much see a future where there are more of us and fewer of those buildings. In fact, you've probably had some of those strategic discussions. Given the economy, and I'd be lovely to hear that you totally missed the bullet because we screwed up the economy. You're welcome. <laughs> it's like, why, why are health care complaints down in Canada? Because we've been watching the Americans screw it up so bad, we're not complaining anymore. <laughs> so what should the future of libraries and librarians be? But that's one future. You've probably talked about it. How much does it cost to heat this building, keep the doors open, secure this building, worry about the maintenance, keep, take care of the asbestos every so often? How long, right? But let's close that down and move the librarians where they matter, which may not be another library, by the way. So the last one is in a democracy. And this one floors me, that we often forget the nobility of our profession. That as librarians, we tend to look at ourselves too harshly. We tend to undersell ourselves to such an extreme that it infuriates me. 
that we look at librarianship, somehow we say, oh, we're not clerks. Well, what do you do? Well, I do a lot of clerk stuff. Right? That, and somehow we've given up the notion that democracy is our ultimate goal. In fact, when, we, when we're doing this, we looked at the data and you look at the literature and what I ask for your conversations tomorrow is do not let technology overwhelm your commitment to democracy. What I mean by that, I mean our previous speaker, right, that security and innovation don't always go together. Sometimes technology gets in our way, right? I'm a technologist, I'm a gadget freak, I've got the iPhone, I've got the iPad, it's so cool, right? But there's a time to put it down. And we can't forget why we're doing them. That technology, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, fabulous tools, but tools, just like an index, an encyclopedia. I am not a Luddite. What I'm trying to say is we are tool users and builders. And technology goes all the way back to the wheel, right? And mark, and controlled vocabularies, and once again from the Twitter feed, alphabetizing words is a technology, right? Why are we doing this? I think that there is no more noble aspiration than democracy, than the notion of giving a community and a civilization a voice in its own future. Whatever we do, we can't cloud it from that. When we talk about our values and our ethics and our morals and all these things, we need to see what is that rudder that's keeping us going straight. But that's another talk. Now, where did the, I would love to say I came up with this wonderful title, but actually I stole it from Mel. Um, this is a Melville Dewey quote, the librarian must be a librarian militant before he can be a librarian triumphant. I try and model myself on uh, Melville Dewey. I've lost my hair for him. <laughs> Ruined my eyes. And you know, he's an upstate professor in the libraries. I, I sort of skipped the anti-Semitic misogynist part, but other than that, <laughs> Dewey 2.0, right here. And I don't necessarily know the context, but what I, I love the phrase. And the phrase is, you know, stop the insanity. Stop underselling your role in this future. If there's one message that I can give you, stop underselling your ability to shape the future that you want. And I will tell you that to shape that future, you must be more than nice. You must be more than beloved. You must be a militant. You must actively acquire power. Now, it's interesting when I say this, um, now I teach in an information school, so we have folks who come in the telecommunications industry, information management, financial services, we call them the devil, they come in and we have librarians. And it's funny because when I get up and I give a speech about information is power, like half the room goes, yeah, another half the room goes, well, I don't <laughs> canvas bags, anyway. Three people got that joke, all right. I, I, uh, so, a great book, if you haven't had a chance to read it, but you're all much more literate than, than we are in the States, so I'm sure you've read it 300 times and have it highlighted, but there is a fellow, uh, a radical in the, in the actually 30s and 40s and through the 70s named Saul Alinsky wrote a great book called The Rules for Radicals. Now, I don't care if you're a communist, a progressive, a socialist, I mean, hell, you could be a capitalist, which would be hilarious because you'd look like a socialist to me, but... <laughs> He wrote this great book, and he uses this word power. And the idea is that he would have people come and talk about organizing and becoming a community organizer. And they'd ask, why do you want to be a community organizer? Well, I'd want to get food for the poor, and I'm going to house. He goes, no, you want power. You want power. And they go, eh, you want power. To Saul Alinsky, the sin was not in having power or accumulating power. It was of depriving other people of power. If you look, and as a librarian, you say that part of your role is to empower someone, to give power to, where is the reserve that you're pulling from? Where is that goodwill that you can bring to it? So we should not shy away from this notion of power. So Alinsky's words. Why not, why not use other words? Why not talk about empowerment? Why not talk about these other ideas? Words that mean the same but are peaceful and do not result in such negative emotional reactions. As we use purifying synonyms, we dissolve the bitterness, the anguish, the hate and love, the agony and triumph attached to these words, leaving an aseptic imitation of life. Power can be abused. Power can be misused. 
power is also the thing that allows us to do what we want. Authority is a form of power.